Hello everyone, good morning or good afternoon for those that um, are in the afternoon. So welcome to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. This is the last day of the Falling Walls Summit. And here uh, we bring you this format, um, which is a, com a partnership between the um, Federal Ministry of Education and Research and Springer and Nature. And the idea here is that we, uh, we talk about speakers, um, background, their interests and their opinion in a lot of subjects um, that are pertinent nowadays. Um, my name is Philippe Almeida. Uh, I'm an associate editor at Nature Biomedical Engineering. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to be your host today. I'm going to talk um, with the speaker today. And so you, um, the public, are encouraged to raise your hand on Zoom if you have any question for our speaker. So today we have the pleasure of having Sheila Janov, Jazanov, who is um, Fosmeiner, probably I'm not pronouncing this correctly, but Fosmeiner, Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Harvard Kennedy School. Sheila he's, uh, is a speaker at the Falling Walls Breakthrough Day. Uh, which is going to happen today, and she's the um, one of the ten winners in the category of uh, social sciences and humanities. So, congratulations, Sheila, for your prize, and thank and welcome to this conversation. So, I wanted to um, to start um, by asking, um, what led you to follow this extensive path? that is across so many different areas, particularly uh, in arts and science. What, what made you, if you could talk about any particular inspirational time in your life that brought you here? So the beginning was actually quite mundane. It was trying to deal with a two-career marriage and being in the same general humanities area that was mm -hmm. quite arcane because it was... Um, in the humanities uh, doing historical linguistics. Uh, and at some point I had to decide on a more practical career. So I went to law school uh, and quickly discovered that working for corporations was not exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And so I became an environmental lawyer and um, then ended up in a university town that was too small to support the practice of a specialist field like environmental law. And so I, uh, became a member of a small interdisciplinary group on campus. This was at Cornell University. And there was a program on science, technology, and society. And once I landed there, I started thinking seriously about a topic that people had not paid much theoretical attention to and certainly not enough research attention to. And that is, how do science and technology really fit into our lives? What kinds of impacts do they have? How well prepared are we as societies to even deal with sciences and technologies? And once that gate was opened, of course, it reaches into every dimension of human lives and human, human society. So there was no looking back once I got there. Absolutely, that's fascinating. And you've read, you've wrote, uh, wrote a lot of books, um, and your most cited, um, or, or your most recent one, not cited, I apologize for that, uh, is titled Can Science Make Sense of Life? Can it? And what's the message of that book? The message of that book, I mean, first of all, I should say that Can Science Make Sense of Life is the most recent book-length addition to an oeuvre dealing with biology and humanity that goes back, I think, to the beginning of the 1980s, so it's a topic I've been working on for a long time. The brief message of the book is that, of course, science can make sense of life at a biological level by telling us much more in detail about uh, the ways in which we function as biochemical entities and how we um, interact in that sort of biological, mechanical way with the environment around us and the mechanics of what is happening in the body. But making sense of something is not only about how it functions, but also what meaning it has in its wider context. I mean, you can teach somebody 
how a camera functions, but you can't thereby teach them how to frame photographs and what to take pictures of. This is why we have, everybody has an iPhone or something like that in Western societies and they can take pictures all they like. Not everybody becomes a famed photographer because those people who master that kind of art are asking a different kind of question, which is about meaning and purpose. How does one use these skills to achieve um, a deeper understanding of what it's all about? And so uh, what I say in my book is that biology helps us understand, or the life sciences writ large, help us understand what life is, but not what life is for. So that addition of the for, I think encapsulates in the briefest possible language the main message of that book. And then I spell out all kinds of places where the confusion between the two things, the uh, capacity to say in a scientific and technologically sophisticated way what life is in its functionalist mechanical terms has led people to suppose erroneously that this also leads them to a deeper understanding of what life is for and and this is what i deny in the book oh, that's that's fascinating uh, well uh, so what's uh, what are the opportunities and I, i i can imagine that in your book maybe um you talk about this um but what is the inter uh, what are the opportunities at the interface um, between art and, and science? It's a, uh, you know, I'm an academic. Academics are always tempted to step back and say, let's define the terms. Um, I'm on the other side of the Atlantic from where I am normally because I'm based in the United States. As you pointed out, I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School, which is a school, by the way, of public policy. So it's, you know, a rather technical place in a sense. Um, by arts, we usually mean the humanities, and I am more in the branch of Wissenschaft, since we're speaking in Germany, that is more associated with the social sciences, that is understanding what, what society is about. So the connections are deep, whether you're talking about the humanities or the social sciences. Science and technology are part of the ways in which human beings learn to know it themselves and to appreciate themselves. And you could say the same thing about the other branches of knowledge. I actually am rather fond of the German term Wissenschaft because it's about knowing and it doesn't draw a distinction prima facie between whether you know through instruments in a laboratory or whether you know through in introspection and painting and poetry or whether you know by studying you know how societies are composed the field that i study and that underpins the the breakthrough that is being celebrated at this occasion that field says that science and technology can be studied through social science and humanistic lenses that it actually makes the work of science more understandable so for instance these days if you're a scientist at the bench you still have to represent the work that you're doing and you have to do it visually in some sense so scientists learn how to make graphs and charts and visual representations those are a form of art in a sense mm -hmm. because you're having to decide how to put things in a uh, form that other people, probably those in your discipline, but maybe not, maybe other people as well, will learn you know, how to read. Uh, some people in this audience are probably familiar with um, uh, former Vice President Al Gore's work on climate change, where he made a movie called An Inconvenient Truth. So there's a point in that movie where Al Gore, who is a layperson, he's not a scientist, he's a politician, he tries to explain to his audience, um, what does it mean for the, the temperature of the world, of the globe, to be going up as fast as it is doing? And he gets up on a forklift and it shoots him up you know suddenly into and you know so by that dramatic manifestation he is displaying what scientists have called the hockey stick graph because suddenly somewhere in the middle of the 19th century our 
mean global temperature takes that kind of, of leap up. I've always thought that that was uh, an excellent moment that illustrates a kind of answer to your question. I mean, you know, science may have a thing called that it calls a hockey stick. Even the hockey stick graph, it presupposes that people understand what hockey is and what a hockey stick is. So there is this kind of mundane connection between the life of interpretation, the life of language, and the life of science that, you know, you, you can't get out of it. I mean, thinking that science is in an ivory tower and is so esoteric, I think actually depreciates our capacity as human beings to be on the same wavelength as the scientists and to try to understand what it is they're doing. So I see these connections as ubiquitous, essential, and nevertheless in need of continually reiterating in language that people will understand, that people will grasp, and that people will resonate with, because it actually makes science more immediate and more intimate and more a part of life, rather than something that Martians do, you know, in some green environment that uh, is fluorescent and that we don't understand. So do you think we should have more um, multidisciplinary and uh, interactions between um, experts that speak or that study different fields and they can show different perspectives and different perspectives will ultimately... I mean, I think it's always good to come out of your own discipline because, you know, there's a, a saying that the fish don't know that they're in water, mm -hmm. that you sort of have to be outside and be a land animal to understand that this is water and there are fishes. That So w what does it mean? It means that many things that we take to be natural are not natural. We made them that way. Mm -hmm. You know, public transportation is much more natural in Germany than it is in America. I've lived in Berlin myself for months at a time and have not felt the need for a car. But then when I go to a bus stop in Berlin or to the U-Bahn or the S-Bahn and I see a timetable posted, I know that the relevant vehicle will come at roughly that time. I can go down the block you know, where my house is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I will not know when the bus is coming, even though there is a posted schedule. The relationship between that schedule and when the bus comes is much less naturalized in a sense. So for someone living in Berlin who comes to Boston or to Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, the the idea of public transportation has a very different meaning. So I think that crossing lines, whether between disciplines or between cultures or between sectors of activity like the public and the private, that these things have a value because it enables one to understand how the production of something that looks natural is actually very artificial, mm -hmm. that you're creating boundaries and inside the boundary it looks natural, but the alternatives may lie outside. And that has been, in a way, the key to the particular kinds of interdisciplinarity that I encourage so that mm -hmm. people are continually aware of the values inside by looking at what they're leaving outside. Okay, well, that's fascinating. And what would you like to see more in the world? Yes, well, what would I like to see in the world? I mean, right now the world is not in a good place, so there are many things I would like to see in the world that um, are not happening. I mean, we just went through an American election, uh, and there were things that all of us um, would have liked to see, regardless which part of the political spectrum we're coming from. But I think that for this conference, which is about science, and you know the the uh, password for the internet here is enjoy science, um, but I take science to mean human knowledge and and human knowing. I think that what I would want is a much more open environment in which the pathways to knowing are more charitably understood, mm -hmm. that people appreciate that there are different ways of knowing things deeply mm -hmm. and that they don't prioritize these ways um, you know, from the beginning, from the outset, so that they de facto create a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It used to be said in the 20th century that physics was the queen of disciplines. I don't know why it had to be gendered, but in any case it was. 
but why? I mean, you know, of course, mathematicians always said that physics was a come down from mathematics, which is the true purest field. It was my own undergraduate field of study, so I know something about it. But why bother creating the hierarchies? Why not instead understand that these are all culturally specific and interestingly bounded areas of work and that a deeper set of understandings for society and for humanity is reached by appreciating both what is strong within and what the limitations are and you know therefore what what the need is to be open about you know both the possibilities and the limitations of the things that one does i would like to see a science environment in which that capacity which in my field we call reflexivity, to reflect back on oneself, that this is more regularly understood as a virtue, as something that one must cultivate. I would like to see that world. And, and how would we implement those uh, in order to achieve that? Uh, which kind of, um, what, what, what is needed to achieve that, you think? Yeah, I, I think that this is, a little bit like asking, you know, what is needed to become a more um, effective citizen in the world, for instance. I mean, we all are, whether we like it or not. Uh, even the placeless, even the displaced are, in a sense, citizens. They're just disempowered in certain senses. So I think that the um, one has to examine one's own context and see where one can be effective. One thing that I try to teach to my students, who are many of them in the environmental sciences and environmental humanities, is that we can all become better stewards by sort of seeing what we're doing and taking it a step further in a sense. I mean, how could we become a little more active about those things that we believe in? And so I think this is true of, of academia. You can take the next step. Um, and this is, I mean, you know, to me, it's kind of the unspoken ethos of falling walls. I mean, why do you want the wall to fall? It's very um, poignant to go outside this hotel where we happen to be talking and see the remnants of the wall and to realize that one time it was militarized and that if you took those few steps from, you know, one place to another, you were making a run for your life in a sense. Um, now you can just go there and it's a kind of living, breathing artwork. So, uh, you know, that capacity that we can turn our walls into memorials that symbolize, you know, the capacity to take steps beyond, that is the thing that I try to teach in my context. Mm -hmm. But for that, I think one needs to begin with a solid understanding of where one happens to be standing understand that, and then take the step beyond. Well, um, that's fascinating. And unfortunately, we just have two minutes left. Um, so uh, what has what is your take on this Falling Wall Summit so far? And what are you looking for later in this uh, final day? <laughs> well, no, when one still has one's own performance to do, there's always that bit of trepidation that, you know, do I understand this audience? I mean, it's not that it's not that I don't speak in front of all kinds of audiences, but each one is special. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing from other people as well and, you know, taking away a set of, you know, different understandings from what I see in my context. You know, I've already spoken to someone who founded a kind of human rights organization and uh, another one who is a refugee. I mean, you know, so just a different set, a mix of people who are trying to understand science from their own experiential positions. And to me, that is the, the pleasure and the excitement of being, you know, in this particular venue at this moment. Okay. Thanks for that. And just a final final question, because I'm really cur curious. If you weren't, uh, if you'd have to choose an alternative uh, career path, what would it be? Well, I've always thought that I might have been a psychiatrist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll leave it there. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, to meet you and to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. A pleasure. And thank you for our audience um, and everyone. And thank you. Thanks. Okay.